Okay, well, good evening and welcome to this evening's Caring for Creation webinar. It's the first in our forum series for the 2021-22 season. In just a moment, we'll welcome tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Dan Vimont of the Nelson Institute Center for Climatic Research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. First though, we wanna have a lively discussion tonight. So please take an active part by submitting questions and comments and even brief stories of climate changes that you've experienced during Steve's presentation. It's easy, just type your question or comment using the chat feature of Zoom. On my laptop screen, there's a chat button uh, in the uh, lower center of the screen. On an iPad, the chat button's probably in the upper right corner. And if you're using some other device, I have no idea where it might be, but please look. When you click the chat button, please select the option to send your comment or question to all panelists and attendees. And don't forget to click the enter key to actually send it. Dan will scan the chat entries and may respond to some during his talk or in the discussion period afterwards. And now here's Gisela Kutzbach, one of the founding members of our Caring for Creation group to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Todd. By way of introduction, the photo of Dan that you see here on the Bethel poster was only an excerpt from the next photo. Here is Dan yeah. holding a brown trout. His catch of the day at the big green river in Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Driftless area. Dan is famous on campus for his saying, I would rather go fishing. And who wouldn't want to go fishing with Dan? He's passionate about science and people, a real human being, his graduate stud undergraduate students say about him. He has a knack for getting freshmen excited about science. He knows climate hands-on and from research. And today he will engage us in rethinking what it means to study the impacts of climate change in Wisconsin and how to prepare for the future. That process involves collaboration of people of many different perspectives. Dan comes to us with over 20 years of research experience in climate science. His research group at the UW focuses on three major themes, the mechanism of climate variability and change, interactions between weather and climate, and global and regional impacts of climate change. He is the director of the Nelson Institute's Center for Climatic Research. He is co-director of the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, or for short, WIKI. WIKI brings together scientists, managers, and policymakers. Dan earned his PhD at the University of Washington, and he joined the UW faculty in 2003. When Dan came to Madison, my husband, John Kutzbach, was director of the Center for Climatic Research, and John then declared that the UW, always fishing for talent, had made <laughs> a catch. So uh, please, uh, let's get started and submit your questions in chat, and let's go fishing for answers with Dan Raymond. Thank you, Kisla. That was a very kind introduction. I appreciate that very much. I, uh, I have warm memories. I think uh, last time I was uh, in this forum, I, I told some stories about John and uh, uh, just the warm memories that I have of uh, visiting Wisconsin. John was a, uh, a, a mentor to me uh, and was a, a supporter. And I, I uh, I'm very, uh, 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 hold, I hold him in my heart. So I, uh, wonderful to hear those stories. Uh, I want to say hi to everyone and thanks for thanks for having me here. Um, I'm looking forward to, to talking today. Um, 
as I'm as I'm uh, talking today, if you have questions, feel free and type them into the chat bar. If you want to give it a you know give a, a practice uh, you know hello or something in the chat bar just to get a sense for how to use it, um, that'd be fine too. Uh, just to um, uh, break the ice and, and let people uh, make sure that everyone is uh, able to ask questions if they have questions. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. <clears throat> And let's see here. There we go. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you're looking at a uh, an intro slide here uh, for the um, um, uh, Gisela. Can you see the intro slide? Just a nod or something, if you can see it. Are you okay? Great. All right, well, I was asked to talk about Wisconsin's future, uh, living in a warmer world. And there's a lot of ways uh, that I suppose I could uh, present some of this. And um, uh, what, I, what I'm what i going to present today are some of the expected changes that we're going to see with climate change in the, in the coming years here in Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, um, I'm going to begin with a discussion of uh, global climate change and then move on to regional climate change. And, before I get too far, I've realized that I've just lost the chat bar. So hold on a minute. Let me make sure that I have that open in case anybody has questions. There we go. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go. If you if you have questions, if you want to, you know, if you you want to follow up on anything, my contact information is here. Dvimon at wisc.edu. Uh, and then uh, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, uh, wiki.wisc.edu. Um, is another way of uh, uh, kind of following up on some of this. All right, so this is a different picture of me with a fish. Uh, this is a Yellowstone. Uh, this is a, a Yellowstone cutthroat from uh, uh, Wyoming, rather than uh, here in Wisconsin. The previous was a was a rainbow off of the Green River. Um, and uh, I want to just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, as Gisela already introduced, I'm a faculty member in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, and I'm also the director of the Center for Climatic Research uh, at the Nelson Institute uh, Center for Climatic Research. Um, I've uh, been in Wisconsin for, I grew up in the Seattle area. Uh, we moved to Wisconsin in 2003 and have uh, loved, uh, loved our time here. Uh, I've got uh, three kids and we, uh, um, uh, our, you know, we love we love heading to the nature preserve, which you can see behind me right now. I'm not actually sitting out there, but uh, wish I was. Uh, and um, uh, I guess, as Gisela said, uh, I'm, I enjoy fishing. Uh, hopefully, get out before the season ends at the end of the week here. So. I want to start off with uh, I like uh, I, I ran across this quote earlier, and I and I like it for a lot of reasons. Um, I want to provide some historical context. In 1856, Eunice Foote, uh, who was one of, I think, uh, who, who there, were, there were 12 articles, I think, published by women in physical sciences, period, in the 1800s. Uh, and so was, uh, Eunice Foote, I believe, has four or five of them. Uh, and Eunice Foote, uh, the, the, um, um, the quote we have here from an article that she wrote, which precedes uh, Tyndall, uh, precedes some of the earliest, uh, 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 some of the people who would later get credit for essentially the same work. An atmosphere of carbon dioxide would give to our earth a high temperature. And if, as some suppose, at one period of its history, the air had a mixture with it, a larger proportion than at present, an increased temperature. This is in 1856 that Eunice Foote put this forward based on some experiments that she had run uh, using uh, flasks of CO2 and looking at the, the roles of sunlight heating those flasks of CO2. Um, since then, uh, our, uh, our, our science has uh, changed, our science has improved in, in so many ways, but that basic message uh, goes back uh, over 150 years. So I'm going to start today with um, presenting a couple of uh, uh, a couple of uh, slides about global climate change. That's probably going to be a review for most people, um, but uh, I want to I want to start with that to provide sort of a global context and give every, and then I'm going to take a, a really brief intermission at the very beginning. Uh, just in case anybody has any questions about global climate change. So as, as I'm presenting stuff, anything you hear, anything you've heard in the past, questions you may have, I'll take about five minutes to answer some questions and then move on to, to climate change here in Wisconsin. 
I like presenting uh, a couple of uh, a couple of slides at the beginning of most of the talks that I give. The first one I always present is the time series of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere uh, from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And so this is what this curve is. It's called the Keeling curve. Uh, it was taken by uh, uh, Charles David Keeling. Um, and it shows uh, the long-term increase in carbon dioxide. And what I like about this curve is there's so many stories to tell about this. Early on, when, when Keeling started taking these measurements, you see these up and down fluctuations in carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And for the first couple of years, uh, this was an amazing finding. The, what, what Keeling found was the breathing of the biosphere. Every, every summer, as photosynthesis kind of kicks off in the northern hemisphere, or spring and summer, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere goes down as plants start absorbing carbon dioxide and using that for energy. And then as leaf matter falls and starts in carbon dioxide, uh, leaf matter falls and photosynthesis kind of uh, slows down during the, the winter months, carbon dioxide increases in our atmosphere. And so every year we see this up and down cycle. And what's amazing about this, and that, and, and that on its own would have been a, a, a fantastic uh, scientific result. But I, what, I, what I like is the story of perseverance uh, here, that uh, Keeling continued to take these measurements even after the original findings had ended, even after the original uh, you know, funding, uh, during, during times of funding difficulties, he continued to take these measurements. And through that per perseverance, we now have the most iconic time series that we, and the most, the most uh, relevant time series that we have related to climate change, the Keeling curve here. This long-term increase in carbon dioxide uh, is unprecedented. Unprecedented on a lot of, uh, a lot of levels. Uh, for the last, for the history of humans in our uh, earliest, earliest fossil homo sapien fossils go back about 125,000 years. And there is some evidence that there might be other uh, fossils, maybe uh, back to 200 or so thousand years. For 800,000 years, for a million years, carbon dioxide concentrations, we have measurements of carbon dioxide from bubbles trapped in ice and carbon dioxide concentration has fluctuated between about 150 and 300 parts per million. So for the history of humans, carbon dioxide fluctuations have fluctuated between about 150 and 300 parts per million. Those started increasing with the uh, industrial revolution. And in, uh, and we passed 300 parts per million sometime in the early 20th century. In April, 2014, we passed 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide uh, for the first time in the history of humans. So never before had anyone ever, had anyone ever experienced carbon dioxide levels. Just I know humans had ever experienced that. And then with the annual cycle, carbon dioxide decreased through the summer months and then increased and decreased the next summer. And then by November, 2015, we passed 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide for the last time. No one on our planet will ever again experience carbon dioxide concentrations below 400 parts per million. And it's likely that when we pass 500 parts per million, we'll say the same thing. So it's an important message that I think is difficult to internalize. The second piece of the second uh, piece of data that I like to present is the global temperature record, and uh, this shows that indeed our planet has been warming each year, uh, as indicated by a bar here. And the warm, uh, the the red colors indicate a year that's warmer than the twentieth century average. The blue bars indicate a, a year that's colder than the twentieth century average. And we see that there's fluctuations from year to year. And in fact, the biggest fluctuations we get are associated with El Nino events, 1983. Uh, 1998, 2016, and that's what my area of research is, is El Nino and, and the dynamics of how El Nino events uh, evolve. But despite those massive, uh, those, year, those yearly departures in those, in those years, the most obvious signal that we see here is the global warming uh, signal, this warming that's that we've experienced, especially since 1970. Um, and even in the early part of the record as well. So we've warmed by about a degree Celsius. 2020 was the second warmest year on record and there was no major El Nino. 2016 uh, was the warmest year on record and there was a massive El Nino uh, that year. As we move into the future, uh, we will never again experience a, so in, in the 20th century, the warmest year was 1998, a massive El Nino event. 
as we continue moving forward, we will never again experience a year that is as cold as 1998 was warm. So again, we're, this is something that we're leaving behind. It's a, it's a history that, we, that, that is, uh, that's, that's being left behind. The recent IPCC report talks about, uh, uh, links these two in, in language that is as strong as I've seen. It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere. Many changes due to past and future greenhouse gas emissions are irreversible for centuries to millennia, especially changes in the ocean, ice sheets, and global sea level. So the IPCC report, the recent IPCC report that came out says something we've known for a long time that Every, when we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're committed. Uh, it's going to stay there. And it says that we know that there's a, a connection between that carbon dioxide and, and the warming uh, temperatures that we've seen. There's a lot more in the, uh, the recent IPCC report as well. It's always fun uh, reading through these and kind of seeing how, the, how, the, uh, uh, how some of the more technical aspects of our understanding have changed. And one thing that I think is really, uh, has really come out of this last IPCC report that reminds me of John uh, a lot, John Kutzbach, uh, are the, the, the ability to relate the changes that we've seen to some of the paleoclimate records that we now have uh, and the, the uh, uh, um, validity of these paleoclimate records that we now have. It shows that the warming really is unprecedented in the history of our um, of society or, or of the humans. Intermission. Here's a chance to uh, ask a climate scientist. So I'm going to um, I'm going to have uh, I got a, a couple of uh, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes answering any questions you may have. Um, I give this talk around the state all the time, and um, I hear all kinds of questions, and I love getting questions. So uh, if there's anything you've heard, anything you're thinking about, any uh, things that don't sound right or that you know you're concerned about um, about global climate change. Feel free to type in the chat bar and I'd be happy to answer. So we're gonna take a couple of minutes to do that. Um, I see a question here from Janice. Uh, why does the photosynthesis in the Northern hemisphere have more of an effect than photosynthesis in the Southern hemisphere? Is it because the reading is taken at Mauna Loa? You nailed it, Janice, absolutely right. The Mauna Loa Observatory is in the Northern hemisphere. And so we see that seasonal cycle uh, following the Northern hemisphere. In fact, when we have measurements in the Southern hemisphere, they're flip-flopped from the Northern hemisphere in terms of that annual cycle. Uh, and it's not as strong either because there's less land in the Southern hemisphere. Once carbon dioxide is put into the atmosphere, it circles the globe within about a week or two uh, the, in, in, the, in the east-west direction, very quickly equilibrates. But it takes a long time to move across the equator for reasons that are associated with the dynamics of a fluid on a rotating sphere. Uh, and so it takes about two years for something in the northern hemisphere to start being seen uh, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and so there is a bit of a lag in the southern hemisphere for that long term warming, uh, but that seasonal cycle is flip flopped. So good question. I'll uh, give a chance. Uh, can you please refresh our information? El Nino linked to a big rise in temperature. Yes. Uh, El Nino events are um, uh, events that occur in the tropical Pacific, and they involve a complete reorganization of the heat content of the largest ocean basin on Earth. So uh, the largest area on Earth, the tropics, the largest ocean basin on Earth, uh, the Pacific, and the ocean, which has a massive heat capacity. And so that rearrangement causes uh, somewhere between a two to five degree Celsius warming, depending on where you're at in the Pacific in the equatorial Pacific. And that can that releases a lot of heat to our atmosphere and then that, that eventually warms the, uh, the earth as well. Those events last about one year. And so what we saw with, those with that time series is we get a spike in temperature whenever there's an El Nino event, which lasts about a year. Um, and we see those in 1983, 1998, and uh, 2016, the, the really big El Nino events that we've seen. Uh, those spikes are on the order of a couple of tenths of degree globally. When we average around the globe, it mutes the, the real strong warming that we see right in the Pacific. Um, so uh, we, we do see a little bit of a, a spike there, but that, that spike is dwarfed compared to the, the long-term uh, increase that we're seeing uh, due to climate change. Uh, good question, Lynn. Uh, Todd. Is it true that if we instantly reduce global CO2 emissions by say a factor of 10, we'd still see continued global warming? 
Uh, yes, it is, uh, because the amount of carbon dioxide that we have in the atmosphere um, will continue to, so think of it like a, a, uh, a, um, uh, a bathtub. If there's a drain at the bottom of the bathtub, so, and, and that drain is draining, it's a stick of water in the bathtub like carbon dioxide. That drain is trying to drain water out of that bathtub and it's a small drain. And so over time, eventually that carbon dioxide will decrease. But right now the faucet is on more, it, it's putting more water in than that drain can remove. And we keep on turning the faucet even more each year. So we're putting more and more water in, more so than that drain can remove. If we turn the faucet off completely, even if we were to stop emitting completely, there's still a lot of water left in the tub. That, wa that, that CO2, that extra CO2 would continue to cause us to warm uh, a little bit for uh, 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 until, until that was absorbed uh, by, the, uh, by the climate system or until the climate system came into equilibrium. So we would still see a little bit of warming there. Um, you know, the one question, you know, I, I say that nobody will ever see 400 parts. I believe that's true. Uh, 500 parts per million, I don't know. Maybe we won't hit that. I think it's pretty likely we will. But one thing that I don't know about is what geoengineering will do for us uh, as we start removing carbon from the atmosphere. Microsoft is already purchasing. Um, uh, Microsoft is trying to not only reduce its emissions, it's trying to eliminate, it's trying to remove all of its emissions since 1975. And I think we'll see more companies starting to do stuff like that with carbon capture technologies and geoengineering. So, uh, Rolf, what do you say when you meet a naysayer given the general backlash against science we are experiencing now? Data just doesn't always convince people. That's correct. For, um, paleontologists have been dealing with science and literacy for decades in the museum world for many of our visitors. That's, Rolf, you, put, you may have more experience uh, with this than I do. Certainly the, uh, you know, this last year and a half has shown us uh, that science doesn't always uh, convince uh, people to, to change their minds. Um, I, we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing movements uh, in the last, the, the one thing I think that, 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 that I've noticed in the last decade at least uh, is that there's been a, a complete shift in the business community, the insurance communities, uh, in management communities. Uh, think about Ford Motor Company. Uh, GMC. Uh, so Ford Motor Company uh, 20 years ago came to us because they were putting together their 100-year business plan. Think of that, a 100-year business plan. Uh, they came to us 20 years ago concerned about climate change. Uh, you know, this recent uh, uh, acknowledgement that they were going to move their entire fleet to, to electric vehicles is not something that happens overnight. They've been planning this for a very long time. It wasn't because of Biden's uh, climate goals that that, that that changed. And so it's exciting to see that change. Uh, at this point, when I see um, uh, these naysayers, you know, like strong nays naysayers, I almost triage that away. I hate to say it, but some people you aren't going to convince. And that number is getting smaller and smaller, which is reassuring. Uh, last question I'll take here, uh, Sigrid, um, what is your best guess for greenhouse gas temperature will end up in 2050 and 2100? What is a crucial, crucial factor now? I think we're going to pass two degrees Celsius sometime by about 2050, 2060, two degrees Celsius is a warming. We should have already passed that except aerosols have been shading the planet. And as we start reducing the amount of aerosol emissions, uh, that's going to allow the carbon dioxide uh, signal to come out even stronger. That's one of the things I think is really uh, troublesome. We improve air quality by re re reducing the amount of dust in the atmosphere, which reflects solar radiation. And as a result, we end up with a little bit more warming. So I think we'll probably exceed two degrees sometime uh, 2050, 2060. 2100, that's, you know, that's uh, anybody's guess. Uh, it depends on what we do as a global society. Uh, I'd like to think that we, uh, we, we come together and we tackle this issue. And uh, boy, uh, I would love to talk to you about uh, things that sound like science fiction, but are, are happening now, like carbon capture, uh, like changes in the way uh, nuclear energy is produced. Uh, helium-3 is one that uh, the, using uh, helium uh, isotopes to change the efficiency of, of fission or fusion. Um, there are so many opportunities right now for technology uh, to um, uh, take off in ways that we just don't understand right now. 
that uh, by 2100, uh, I have no idea. Um, and uh, that'll be one for my kids to, uh, kids to see. So, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to um, move on to looking at what this means locally and what we're doing here in Wisconsin. So thanks for those questions, great questions. Uh, single most important act, I'm going to get right back to that Sigurd. So at, at the end of the talk, so uh, there's a, there, there is no single most important act. Uh, there are lots of acts. All of us can be doing something. All of us can be contributing in ways that are important for us. And I think that's one of the exciting things about opportunities to, uh, to, to deal with this. So good questions, Sigurd. Both very good questions. Thank you, everyone. All right, let's take a look at Wisconsin. Uh, this comes from the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, which was uh, a, org a group that we put together in 2007-2008 uh, uh, after um, uh, Mark Miller asked a question, you know, I, fine, I, you know, I, who was a, a senator, uh, Senator Miller asked the question, I get climate change is happening. I understand the uh, the science of it. I understand that it, I'm, I'm not doubting that. What I'm asking is, what does it mean for my constituents? And so we uh, we met with the DNR, uh, the Nelson Institute met with the DNR, and we had a series of talks back and forth about climate change and management opportunities. And at the end of this, a uh, uh, we got together and put together an organization that's a different, a very different organization. That's the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. And instead of a typical organization, which is kind of a linear hierarchical organization where you have people telling other people what to do and they do the work and, and so forth, we realized that uh, that doesn't work with climate adaptation. Uh, this idea that the climate scientists can tell the, you know, tell us what the climate's going to be like in 2050, they'll pass that on to ecologists who will run their models, they'll pass that information on to policymakers and everybody will make good decisions. That doesn't work. Uh, because what really happens is the climate scientists tell you a bunch of information that the climate scientists think is important, and it turns out it's not important at all, and then everything's done. End of organization. Uh, and that happens over and over and over again. And so what we did is we said, let's organize this as a conversation. And so Wiki is a Wiki is an open organization that fosters the conversations that have to occur in order for us to understand what climate change means. I'll give some examples of that as we go through. This is the most recent data we have uh, for climate change in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's warmed by about two degrees, two to three degrees Fahrenheit from 1950 to present. And these yellow, uh, these yellow colors here indicate about three degrees warming. Those are annual average temperatures. Everywhere where there's a star indicates that that trend is, is, is distinguishable, stati statistically distinguishable from the natural variability in our, from the year-to-year -year variations in our climate system. So we have a robust warming here in Wisconsin, about the same as the global average right now. That warming is not distributed evenly between daytime and nighttime, and that's important. Uh, the daytime highs have warmed a little bit, but nighttime lows have warmed a lot more, and that's consistent with increases in carbon dioxide. Uh, I can go into the dynamics of why that's the case if you, if you want to hear more about that, but that's what our models will tell us as well, and that's what, from theory, that's what we would, we would infer as well. When our observations tell us something, our models tell us the same thing, and we have a good theoretical understanding for why that's occurring in the first place, all of that put together is what we call an emergent constraint. It tells us that we, we, we have a lot of confidence that what we're seeing is due to those, uh, those physical processes is due to climate change. So this warming that we're seeing here, uh, especially the nighttime warming is, a real, is, a, is an important signature. <clears throat> um, that warming is also not distributed equally around the seasons. Winter, has warmed a lot more than summer. That's also consistent with uh, uh, our models and with our theories. And so uh, we've warmed by about uh, four or five, uh, maybe even six degrees of uh, uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, from 1950 to 2018. Um, we have uh, to 2020 would be very similar. Um, and our future projections suggest we should see another six or seven degrees Fahrenheit of warming by mid-century. Uh, so by 2050, we see that, that 
uh, that mean? Because these are for nighttime minimum temperatures in winter time. So let me be very clear there. That seems very specific, but I'm gonna I'm gonna explain why that's why that's important uh, in just a minute. Why do we care about that? Well, winter temperatures are important for a variety of reasons. One is ice. This is uh, a uh, ice ridge up by Governor uh, Nelson uh, State Park on Lake Mendota. Uh, lake Mendota is the most studied uh, lake on Earth uh, due to the uh, Center for Limnology. Due to, uh, was Gisla, was John involved in those bushel, bushel barrel, barrel experiments, those famous bushel barrel? He probably was involved in them somehow. I've seen some nodding there. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this shows the duration of ice cover on Lake Mendota from 1860 to uh, mid 20th century or mid 20, uh, uh, 2015 or, or 20, what is this, 2017 or 18. And you don't need to draw a trend line in here. Everywhere there's red means that there was more ice than usual. I should flip flop the colors. Everywhere there's red means that there was, the ice was there longer. So we had 162 days of ice cover in 1882. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that out there, 1882. Think of a literary reference for the region here that talks about uh, 1882, 1881, 1882. 162 days, which sounds awesome to me. Like, I love winter. That, that'd be fun. 2002, uh, we had a, a, a year with uh, about 21 days of ice cover. Uh, and so the impacts of that uh, are substantial, not just for tourism, but I want to give an example here of uh, impact for bird populations, for the piping plover. The piping plover is a shorebird uh, that lives uh, in, um, uh, on, in, in, in sandy habitat. And when, it, when a predator comes along, the pi piping plover, when it sees the predator, jumps away from the nest and pretends like his wing's broken. Like, a, uh, what is it, the, um, um, oh, I'm not coming up with the other name that does this, the uh, kill deer, I think. Um, when there's more ice, the ice scours vegetation from the shoreline, which makes it harder for predators to hide. And so the piping plover can see the predators and do this little adaptation strategy. So ice is good for the piping plover habitat. I'm a climate scientist. I study how two fluids on a rotating sphere interact with each other, like the, the mathematics of theirs. I, I wouldn't know a piping plover if it landed on my shoulder, right? The only reason I know this is because of conversations with wildlife managers or wildlife scientists or, or ornithologists who are thinking about how climate change may be affecting specific species. This is where that conversation is critical. The conversation, once I know this, I realize, oh, this is why ice cover is important. That's something we should start to study more. This is what Wiki allows. Another example, the Berkebeiner. Berkebeiner uh, is run every, uh, every February, and in the last few years, they've had to change the course uh, or uh, change, I think they even may have shortened the course one year. Uh, and when we were getting, and, and so when we were getting going on this, uh, I'm going to skip kind of the, the details that this shows uh, rain versus snow, and it shows that we're going to get a lot, uh, we have more rain events during the winter time uh, with this warming that we're expecting during winter. Um, so rain on snow events are detrimental for, for uh, snow cover. But I want to just tell a story about the Berkebeiner where I said, look, we're, we, we now have this data where we can start, uh, we can start taking a look at uh, the snow cover in late February. And Ned Zielsdorf at the time was the, was the race director. And, uh, you know, so as a climate scientist, I'm coming forward with this information. And he says, you know, we don't really care about that because we can always adjust our race. We're, we're not that affected by that. We can move the race, we can, we can uh, bring in snow, we can adjust our course, we can adapt for that sort of stuff. What, we, what really is important for us is that all, most of our skiers come from the Chicago, the Chicago and the Minneapolis areas. And so what matters to us is the duration of the snow season and the quality of the snow season, because if they train, they show up for the race. If they can't train, they don't sign up for the race. And so instead of that, what, what I thought was an important impact, 
the snow cover on the day of the race, the more important impact is the duration of the snow cover. And so what this shows is that our snow season uh, will be reduced by about a, uh, a month and a half to two months uh, from uh, by mid-century compared to uh, present conditions. Um, extremely cold nights. Uh, fewer, uh, warmer winters mean that there are less nights where the temperature gets below zero degrees Fahrenheit. That's good news for heating bills. Uh, it's bad news for invasive species. Uh, it means that there's less uh, kill off of, uh, of pests and invasive species for agriculture and for uh, forestries. Uh, this is Stephen Handler up here on the upper right here. He works with the Northern Institute for Applied Climate Scientists and or for Applied Climate Sciences. And he works with uh, forest owners around the state to try and identify what climate change means for how they manage their forests. They're starting to plant trees in ways that will be more sustainable because of the warming temperatures and because of uh, uh, and, and plant uh, uh, tree species to uh, protect against potential uh, pests. Uh, the Northern NIACS is has been a, a leader, a, a U.S. leader in uh, uh, their their efforts at uh, advancing climate adaptation. And in fact, uh, the Forest Service as a whole has taken their model and is is, is generalizing that around the U.S. Uh, their climate adaptation menus, their climate adaptation workbooks that they put together to try and help people understand what they could do to combat uh, the, to to adapt to climate change. Is now being used for wildlife, for agriculture, uh, for plant and natural communities, uh, for a wide variety, for uh, tribal resources, for a wide variety of areas. And it's very exciting to see uh, these tools being developed and being put in the hands of people who can then uh, 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 manage our, our uh, natural resources better. All right, um, there's other uh, examples here. People are already being affected by climate change, uh, by warming winters. There are, there, we're already adapting on the fly. And I'll, I'm gonna skip that uh, and move on to, uh, rather than providing more examples. There's so many examples of this in, in Wisconsin. It's really exciting, uh, but you know, I don't wanna keep you here past you know, 1130 or something. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, just move on. That's a joke, I'm gonna be done. Summers. If winter is warming more than the average, then the summer must be warming less than the average, and that's what we've seen in the historical record. Uh, in fact, uh, nowhere in Wisconsin do we see significant upward trends in temperature during the summertime. That's really important. Uh, those trends are upward, but they're not distinguishable from natural variability yet. Our future projections also show that summer should warm the least. We still expect to see about four degrees Fahrenheit warming by mid-century, but that's a lot less than wintertime and that's summertime uh, day, uh, daily maximum temperatures. There's still some uncertainty about that. Uh, we may see a lot more warming than that, depending on what happens with precipitation. Uh, some of the models that are being run by Michael Notero and the Center for Climatic Research suggest that drying of soil moisture may actually exacerbate warming during summer in ways that aren't currently captured by other models. And so this is research that's currently going on at the Center for Climatic Research to try and better understand the physical processes uh, that will affect our climate and what we care about. What does that mean? Uh, this is what I'm hoping to catch on Thursday when I go out fishing for the last time this year. Uh, some uh, some uh, fall uh, brook trout. I've got a, I, I, I block off my day. I put an aquatic research conference on my calendar uh, so that everyone knows that I'm, I'm busy all day. Uh, this is a brook trout. It's the only native trout in Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, warmer summers mean that uh, brook trout habitat uh, is reduced uh, in our state. The DNR took this information and went out to the driftless area. Trout fishing is a billion dollar industry annually for the driftless area, and the DNR went around and talked with people around the state. Again, they took this conversation out and said, what are our priorities? What should our priorities for adaptation be? Some streams we're going to triage. We're going to say, we just can't, we can't maintain brook trout trout populations in these streams. Other streams will be just fine. We don't need to worry about trying to manage for brook trout. What are the streams that are somewhere in the middle where we should be, we should be putting uh, money and putting effort into trying to preserve brook trout, trout habitat? And their driftless area master plan then took all of those, uh, those conversations and that information into account uh, when they, when they uh, uh, looked at how they would be managing to, uh, their streams in the driftless area. It's a great example of how science is informing 
uh, science and uh, uh, interactions with the with people in Wisconsin are informing future policy. Uh, this is Matt Mitro. He was in charge of a lot of this, and I, I give him a ton of credit for uh, just just uh, an outstanding example of of climate adaptation in action. Warmer summers also mean very more very hot days. We see about a tripling of the number of days where temperature gets above 90 degrees. Right now that happens about 10 days per year here in Madison. That should happen about 30 days per year by the mid-century. And warmer days are important, but warmer nights are even more important. Uh, we see about a quadrupling in the frequency of nights where the temperature doesn't get below 70 degrees. And if you're like me, you've noticed a lot of these lately uh, in the summertime where the temperature with that, those high dew points uh, stay, stay hot and humid all night long. Uh, that's important because warm nights uh, are critical for human health. If we don't sleep well at night, it exacerbates all kinds of other issues. If uh, for diabetics, it's a, it's a stress for uh, other complications. There's cardiovascular disease. Uh, there's an enhanced likelihood of, uh, of uh, heart attacks and, and so forth. This is especially, uh, this is especially true uh, for uh, elderly uh, or for um, people with other health issues. But it's also true uh, for people with social, uh, that, that are socially vulnerable. And what I'm showing here on the left is a map of, uh, of vulnerability to heat um in 2015 and so where you see these on the left hand side here where you see these bright red colors are regions where people are more vulnerable to heat uh in in these yellow uh areas people are less vulnerable to heat part of that is due to proximity to the lake but a lot of that is due to actually the social situation in these neighborhoods on the right hand side i'm showing a map of historical redlining uh from 1938 where communities were graded based on whether or not uh, uh, they, uh, communities were graded and based on the grade that they got, A, B, C, or D, communities were either eligible for financing from banks, loans uh, to develop uh, things like grocery stores, to develop uh, new houses, develop community infrastructure. Uh, or if there was if if uh, it was a D, then they were not eligible for those because they were uh, worried for that that these these communities would uh, default on on loans. One of the criteria that was used in 1938 was the racial demographic of the communities, especially uh, whether or not there were Jewish uh, people in the community and whether or not uh, there were black uh, uh, community members. Uh, whether the community had a, a large uh, population of uh, a, a large black population. Uh, in those cases, uh, banks were not allowed uh, to loan to these communities. And we see that these historically red line districts are the districts that today are still the most vulnerable. And we know that occurs because without, uh, without investment in infrastructure, without investment in community infrastructure, uh, uh, these neighborhoods uh, still lack uh, uh, a lot of the social structures that would allow them to be more resilient to climate change as well. We saw this uh, borne out in the 1995 Chicago heat wave, especially uh, where red line districts were far more likely to experience deaths due to heat uh, than other, other areas. And I'm bringing this up in this in this community, especially because I think it's I think as a as a you know the caring for creation as a community of faith it's something that we look at, we we look to our community we look uh, as how we we can be community members and thinking about uh, ways that that we that we have respect for all human beings. Um, the good news is, is that uh, this information is being used by Department of Health Services uh, together with climate information to try and develop resources for uh, public health uh, in these communities uh, to try and go out and, and uh, um, uh, deal with these, these uh, vulnerabilities, let people know uh, options uh, for uh, developing more healthy communities, developing infrastructure, developing cooling centers, communication networks, setting up more green infrastructure, developing ways that uh, we can ensure that all communities are part of solutions to climate change. Uh, environmental and climate justice is an important uh, new field that uh, we certainly uh, are, are concerned with uh, in Wiki as well. Let's see, I'm going to quickly go through precipitation. Uh, 
uh, changes. We've gotten wetter, uh, but mostly during from fall through spring. In southern Wisconsin, we've seen uh, wetter, uh, uh, wetter summers as well. But in northern Wisconsin, things uh, have been back and forth until last decade. Last decade was the wettest decade on record in Wisconsin for all nine of our climate divisions. And we've seen that in a lot of different ways. One, just more rainfall, more precipitation, more snow, uh, but also more extreme events. Uh, this is a map of the, uh, the, the historical 100 year rainfall, 24 hour rainfall event. So what these blue colors indicate are, you know, for example, here in Southern Wisconsin, uh, if we had six inches of rain in one day, that would be considered a 100 year rainfall event. Uh, Wisconsin's experienced over 20 of these 100 year rainfall events in the last decade. Uh, and on a, on, a, on a point by point basis, that doesn't, that isn't necessarily, uh, you know, we still need to do the math on that, but it, uh, mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that these are, are happening more frequently if you just look at this, but it turns out they are happening more frequently. So these extreme rainfall events are, uh, are occurring. That was a really convoluted way of saying these extreme rainfall events are occurring a lot more frequently. And that's consistent with our projections as well. Our projections suggest that we should be seeing more extreme rainfall events. Consequences of those, uh, we saw that in Cross Plains with the uh, uh, 14 inches of rainfall that fell uh, just west of, uh, uh, west of Middleton uh, in August, I believe it was 2018. Uh, August, it would have been, uh, the, I think it was the 20th, August 20th, 2018, I came home, we landed in uh, Milwaukee, I was looking at the radar uh, from Seattle and thinking, oh dear, things do not look good. And when we got home at about 3 a.m., uh, it was still raining and all of our window wells were full of water. And so I was, I was bailing water uh, when we got home uh, from, from that. Here's some examples of, of what occurred with that rainfall event. And I want to show a, a neat study that was done. Uh, in 2014, uh, a model simulation was run to see what would happen if we took a large rainfall event, one that had, one that hit the, the one that hit Lake Delton when Lake Delton uh, uh, drained and, and washed out the highway. And we took the rainfall from that and we moved it over the Yahara Basin. Over, over Lake Mendota and said, what would happen if we had just been unlucky and instead of that rainfall moving north of us, it had moved right over Lake Mendota. And whoops, the, the, the resulting rainfall produced this structure of flooding. The isthmus becomes an archipelago. And when we looked at what happened during 2018, we see the exact same structure uh, uh, with the flooding uh, in 2018. It wasn't as bad in 2018 as it could have actually been uh, because the dam wasn't breached. Uh, and that was, there was some really gutsy decisions made on whether or not to let water through the dam or not. Uh, uh, and, and the decisions were made based on uh, protecting the vulnerable people on the isthmus. And that's something to, you know, that uh, at some point there was a value judgment made uh, it put other people at risk, people that had more capacity to be able to deal with the potential out of the potential flooding events. Uh, but um, uh, that decision was to protect people on the isthmus. An interesting story here, and then I'll, I, I don't want to go too long here. Uh, when, this, when these model uh, simulations came out, uh, you can see here's, I believe, uh, the union is like right over he here. Maybe it's, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I think it's right here, Memorial Union. Memorial Library was right there. And when this was presented to facilities planning, they said, oh my goodness, this is terrible, you know, because there's flooding over by Memorial Library. And they said, well, yeah, but really it's only a couple of inches of water. And they stopped and said, no, all of our rare books are kept in the basement of Memorial Library. One to two inches of flooding means we lose them all. And so this, which was not, was, this was not done necessarily to look at the effects of climate change. It was just a looking at a scenario, thinking, well, what would have happened if we had had more rain? By going through those exercises, we start we, having that conversation, we start identifying ways that we can become more resilient. And so that conversation is just critical in coming up with solutions to how we deal with climate change. All right, 
Uh, I encourage people to take a look at the uh, Wisconsin infra the Wiki Infrastructure Working Group, which has done a, a, an amazing survey of uh, managers around the state and looking at the biggest barriers. There's good news and bad news. The good news is there's things we can. There's easy. There's low hanging fruit for how we can we can start helping communities around the state. Uh, the bad news is the biggest barriers: no state mandate and our political climate, and uh, that has not been helping us at all. Last thing I wanted to present here uh, are a, cu a couple of solutions. This comes from Project Drawdown. Uh, so I've been talking about solutions on how we adapt to what's inevitable. Um, we know that this is coming uh, and there's nothing we can do to stop. Uh, well, let me, let me rephrase that. We need to be acting now because in the next 20 years, we're committed to a certain amount of climate change. But what we do now has an enormous impact later on for our kids and our grandkids. So we need to be acting right now to avoid the massive consequences that would occur at the end of the century if we do nothing. I like this uh, project drawdown because it, it provides uh, solutions uh, for how as a global society we might be able to deal with climate change. And I wanna kind of just go down a couple of the lists. The most efficient solution, the easiest thing we could do is change the way we deal with refrigerants. Not something you necessarily think. As we go down, wind turbines, more windmills, that makes sense. Reduce food waste and plant-rich diet is something that we've heard about. These are the most effective things we can do to combat climate change, ranked in order. Here's what I like. Number six, educating girls. There's something you don't necessarily think of as a way of combating climate change, but by educating girls around the world, especially in developing countries, it provides opportunities for girls. It provides uh, opportunities for when they become women, uh, when they grow up to become women, uh, they have more opportunities in their society and is one of the most important things we can do to combat climate change. The compound benefits, though, it's, it's not just a win-win situation. It's like a win-win win, 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 win situation in this case. Uh, solar farms, silvopasture, um, uh, changing the way we grow food, uh, and then rooftop solar. These are the things, these things already exist. These solutions already exist uh, that we could be uh, taking advantage. This doesn't include things that don't yet exist, but will come on to, will come out in the, in the coming decades, uh, that some of which we don't even know about yet. Uh, and so I think that's something to think about as well. So Project Drawdown, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's a great website. I'm going to skip uh, forward uh, to um, uh, just uh, uh, some conclusions and questions here. So Wisconsin, historical trends, we're getting warmer, we're getting wetter. Uh, that's likely to continue. What we've seen in the historical record is consistent with what our models are telling us. Uh, you know, that's kind of interesting, but I think the more interesting thing is we are already being impacted by climate change. Uh, we've seen more extreme rainfall. Our winters are warming. Uh, our, 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 our social systems, our tourism, et cetera, is already being affected. Uh, and uh, we are seeing increases in humidity. Uh, an important one, Wisconsin communities are already taking action. And I think this is really interesting. Uh, we're seeing a lot of action on the local scale. The Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission has, has been a leader for a decade, at least in, in climate adaptation. Uh, tribal adaptation as a whole, tribes are way ahead of uh, the rest of our uh, society. La Crosse, a decade ago, was starting to put in green infrastructure to adapt to increases in rainfall. And we see examples of where that green infrastructure, not only in La Crosse, but other places uh, around the state, has already uh, proven beneficial uh, for subsequent flooding. Dane County is doing interesting stuff with their landfill. If you haven't seen this yet, the Dane County landfill is the most interesting landfill you'll ever uh, take a look at. Listen to listen to uh, Joe Parisi talk about the landfill sometime. And, you know, you never thought that listening to someone talk about a dump would be that exciting. But uh, uh, they're collecting the methane that's being produced there. Uh, they're converting it into renewable natural uh, gas and pumping that into a pipeline where they sell it back to the uh, they sell it back to the community. It cost them twenty eight million dollars to build this plant to collect that methane and put it back into the pipeline. That'll pay for itself in three years. Twenty eight million dollars paying for itself in three years, and from then on out, anything they make off of that goes directly towards reducing taxpayer burden. 
So uh, this is a win-win, uh, and actually it's a win-win-win situation because you get methane out of it, you reduce, uh, uh, you get money from it, and methane is a terrible greenhouse gas. And so you're collecting that and you're putting it into a different form where people can use. Uh, burning that methane into carbon dioxide is a far better choice than leaving that methane to go out of the atmosphere. Uh, uh, Dane County, Milwaukee uh, has been uh, looking at their infrastructure. Madison's looking at uh, uh, how they run their city and, whether, and how they can be more green, how they can also adapt to expected climate changes. Monroe County is doing a full uh, integrated assessment of how they should be thinking about their future planning, agriculture versus other uh, types of uh, forest agriculture, different land cover, how they can protect themselves against future rainfall. I give an example of the Driftless area. Green Bay is looking at how climate change affects hypoxia in the in the Green Bay uh, in Green Bay itself and uh, circulation with uh, with Lake Michigan, as well as uh, impacts from like the Fox River and, and other areas there. I could go on and on and on. Wisconsin is taking a, a lot of action and it's exciting to see. We're seeing movement on climate change. We're seeing uh, people recognize, I didn't even talk about MG&E and uh, going towards zero emissions uh, because it makes business sense for them. Uh, it makes, it's, it's amazing seeing the change in the last 10 years. And we're doing all this because it matters, right? This is, this is, uh, 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 why, uh, you know, we think about why this is important. Uh, these, this, uh, my kids will be uh, inheriting uh, what we do now. All of our kids will, and our planet will be inheriting this. So we're, we need to be caring for our, our planet, uh, not only for, uh, to, not only just for, for us, but for our kids, for uh, protecting the natural spaces that we grew up with, that, that are meaningful to us, that bring us together. And hopefully in doing this, we can use this as a, as a way to come together to further that conversation like Wiki is doing uh, between scientists and managers, but having that conversation with each other like we're doing here uh, with Caring for Creation. So I'm gonna leave it at that and say thanks to everyone uh, for there's some resources here I'd be happy to share. Um, uh, and thanks to everyone for being here and let's take this conversation forward one of the most important things we can do is continue that conversation with people who don't think like we do. Uh, push other people to think more about climate change, what it means to you, the stories of how it affects you, how it affects our state, and not just the stories about, of loss, but also the stories of opportunity. Um, thanks everyone, and I'd be happy to take some questions in the chat. All right. Todd, uh, should we anticipate significantly more humidity and rainfall as Wisconsin warms by 2050? Will Wisconsin's climate be more like today's climate in central Illinois, Tennessee, or Louisiana, or something else? Uh, be more like central Louisiana. I'm sorry, <laughs> not Louisiana, uh, Illinois. <laughs> Boy, that scares everyone for a moment there. Uh, not quite as bad as, as Louisiana, more like uh, central Illinois. So Madison, more like uh, central, uh, central to southern Illinois, depending on mid-century to late century. Northern Wisconsin is more like Southern Wisconsin or Northern Illinois by the, uh, by the end of the century. Um, uh, we do expect a little bit more humidity and that's, and we are seeing that. Some of that is due to the land cover change as well. We've got a green ocean upstream of us, uh, uh, ocean of corn. Uh, corn, uh, the ev evapotranspiration from corn is enormous. And so we do see a lot of that. Um, Janice. The new climate worry focuses on the fossil fuel companies basically stopping fossil fuels. Uh, do all the individual actions that we could take add up to enough to slow climate change? Uh, no. Um, I, I, I'm, let, me, let me see if I can answer, if I'm getting your question correctly. If we all take individual actions, will it slow climate change? Yeah, it'll, it'll slow it. Do we need more than that? Yes, we need, we need movement. On a on a national on a global scale, uh, Paris just you know was a was a start, and that's it. it, it does Paris really, the Paris Accord really does nothing? Um, one of the things we are seeing that's that's encouraging is that technology has changed enough that it's now becoming more economical to shift toward renewables. And MG&E is an example of that. When MG&E contacted us to talk about what climate change means uh, for uh, our state. We went and talked to them. They developed a their their plan to go towards uh, zero emissions by 2050, 
And they contacted us again to say, hey, is our plan consistent with the IPCC projections the, the, that, that uh, will keep us at one and a half degrees warming? Because they're concerned about that. They announced their plan uh, to go to zero, zero emissions at their annual stakeholder meeting in front of 2,000 stakeholders. So Jeff Keeler, the CEO, announces this for the first time that anyone's heard this. And the first question he gets is, what does this mean for our investments? And his reply was, we are doing this because of your investments. Every dollar we spend on fossil fuels is a dollar that goes out of the state. It's a dollar that we also have no control over the fluctuating price of fossil fuels and how things and, 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 uh, and where it goes. When we develop renewable energy in our state, we have control over those resources, we control pricing, and it ensures that customers and our stakeholders have more steady and consistent returns and uh, uh, energy. So they're doing this because it makes business sense. I thought it was a really strong statement um, that, that it's, a, it's a very different, different world than it was uh, 10 years ago. Um, Todd, as business leaders who perceive the reality of climate change and its consequences, our business leaders who perceive the reality of climate change and its consequences exerting pressure on skeptical legislators. Uh, I, I can't answer that one. I don't, I don't know. I mean, we aren't seeing, we certainly are still seeing uh, an entrenched political uh, response to this. And, you know, it, it seems like the response to everything these days is political. I, you know, my, my concern uh, with the, the politics of this goes way beyond the politics of climate change. It's more uh, a, uh, um, a a culture of, of an inability to communicate with each other anymore. Again, another reason why opportunities like this, caring for creation, bringing people together, talking about issues uh, is so important. Um, upbeat conclusion. Uh, I'm glad it came out as upbeat. There's, uh, there's, there's, um, you know, as a climate scientist, I think about this stuff every day. And so some days you get really depressed about it. And some days you're just, you know, like, well, it is what it is. And then other days you're just amazed at the beauty of the science behind it, you know? Uh, so it's, it's, there's no, um, you know, I think we all want to kind of compartmentalize our, in, you know, are you, are you hopeful? Are you not hopeful? Are you, you know, is, are you worried? Um, yes, 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 and yes, you know, uh, all of us are humans and we all have complex emotions and we deal with things uh, in different ways. Um, Trek has published his plan to get to zero emissions. I mean, I'll look forward to seeing that. That looks, uh, that looks, that looks great. Uh, refrigeration management, yeah, I'll give you a quick, uh, quick, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about how molecules absorb photons. Uh, I just gave this talk to my 101 class. Uh, uh, some molecules are really, really effective at absorbing uh, energy from the earth and enhancing the greenhouse effect. Molecules like chlorofluorocarbons, uh, like sulfur hexafluoride, uh, methane, nitrous oxide, they're really effective. Uh, they're, they're several times more effective than carbon dioxide is just because there's so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere already not because of climate change, just because carbon dioxide, there happens to be a lot of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere, that increasing carbon dioxide doesn't have as big of an effect pound for pound as something like sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur hexafluoride is 30,000 times more effective in enhancing the greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide pound for pound. But we don't have a whole lot of sulfur hexafluoride that we're putting into the atmosphere. We're putting a lot more carbon dioxide in. So carbon dioxide is more important, but not as effective. Refrigerants that we currently use are, as, are, are incredibly effective greenhouse gases. Chlorofluorocarbons, hydrocarbons, uh, uh, there's a couple of other ones that I'm, I'm not going to get the names of, uh, but they're very effective and we don't need to use them. We can be transferring to other gases that we use in refrigerants just by switching those refrigerants. Super easy to do, super cheap to do. We can reduce uh, future global warming by a sizable amount. Um, uh, Pamela, thank you very much for the nice comments there. Um, yes, definitely, definitely talk to people, talk about what they love, talk about what's important to you. You know, I think that's, I think that's important for all of us here. Um, I guess I think about that at the, you know, that's why the slide at the end with the apple orchard, uh, yeah, these things are, these things are important to us. Oftentimes we talk about climate change and what it means in dollars. 
And I don't know how you put a dollar sign on some of these things. What does it, what does it mean to be able to uh, take a walk on the nature preserve with your family? What does it mean? You know, how, how do I put a dollar sign on going fishing with my daughter? Right. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, part of it is, is an ethic. It's, it's who we are and it's recognizing that and, and sharing that. And even though that is changing and some of those things will be gone, we change as well. And as we change, we'll still be experiencing life, right? We'll still be experiencing the joy of being with family, the, the full spectrum of life. Uh, and uh, I, it's, it's something I tell my, my uh, freshmen and my students, you know, that in addition to, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of gloomy thinking about, but you'll, you'll still fall in love. You'll, you'll be amazed by the beauty of your surroundings. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be taken aback by the kindness of strangers in your life. It's still going to happen, but we also need to be dealing with climate change. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. Holistic deer population control policy, probably for, um, uh, so Sigurd, probably, uh, the impact of deer on, uh, on, um, uh, plant and natural communities is a really big one there. Uh, you know, you look at winners and losers in the wildlife world, and unfortunately, the winners are like Canadian geese and raccoons and deer. Uh, the losers are your piping plover, uh, the uh, American martin, and things that are a little more, uh, um, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but um, uh, snowshoe hare uh, just are not adapted well for, you know, you lose the snow and the snowshoe hare being bright white doesn't help things. Uh, so that's another one that, that tends to be a loser in that. Uh, and so more deer tend to graze more uh, and have uh, more of a, uh, an impact there. Probably not as big an impact as some of the other stuff, but it is something important. There. All right, I think I'll, I think I'll call it there. Um, thanks everybody for uh, um, stopping uh, or stopping in and seeing this. I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how. There we go. And uh, thanks everybody for coming by. If you have more questions, I'll, I'll be happy to take some questions in the chat still. Um, but uh, I guess the biggest, you know, uh, thanks to thanks to Gisela and to uh, Todd and everyone for uh, uh, inviting me to be here and for running this series. Uh, it's just wonderful to see everyone and and uh, to continue this conversation. I tried to emphasize that. Uh, I think the thing that that is most inspirational to me is that doing this work brings me in contact with other people uh, and, and, and it creates a community and it, it means that I'm part of a community and for tonight I was part of your community and you're part of mine. Uh, it's something that uh, we need more of these days. We need more opportunities to connect with each other and uh, certainly uh, as part of Bethel Lutheran it's something that we that we hold right? That, that, that a community is, is something deeper than just the, the statement. It's, it's, it's who we are. It's what our, what our beliefs are. And uh, uh, so thanks everyone for, for being here and uh, take this forward. And thank you again, Dan, for such an outstanding presentation uh, to everyone who uh, contributed to the discussion. And a special thanks to our behind the scenes technical support uh, from Ashley Becker and Rob Kolhep. Uh, if you know someone who would have liked to view tonight's event but couldn't, it's been recorded and soon it'll be on the Caring for Creation uh, webpage on Bethel's website. And I want to call your attention to our next Caring for Creation webinar in a month on Tuesday, November 9th. It should be an especially noteworthy event. Our guest speaker will be the Honorable Bob Inglis, former U.S. representative from South Carolina. Since he was primaried out of his House seat in 2010, largely for his stand on climate change, Mr. Inglis has dedicated himself to recruiting and organizing conservative voices for action on climate change. So plan to join us and please spread the word to family, friends, neighbors, or colleagues to hear a perspective that we don't often encounter in Madison. Until then, good night and may good health and the peace of God be with us all.